is it exact because you have so many degree freedom. But that's only the the, the, the most common way of overfit. There are many other ways. So one very subtle way of uh, of overfitting, let me cover this. One very subtle way of overfitting is that you keep building different models, and you test each model against the answer, which is usually the public interval. And then you see whichever model works well, you keep it. And whenever it doesn't work well, then uh, you can drop it. You, you can keep doing this. Actually, in a lot of situations, you can keep doing this, and you will find that um, uh, your models perform. Your models performance on the public board just keeps growing, keeps improving. There's almost no end to it. But the reality is that uh, you are just a public. You are just overfitting the public leaderboard. So actually, that happens quite often. Um, it's um, like in statistics. Okay, I'm not a statistician. I mean, no offense to statistician in the audience. But in statistics, we always use a uh, five uh, percent uh, the significant uh, uh, what's that called? Significant test. So that if something is uh, uh, given you now now hypothesis, if you are you have less than five percent chance of observing what you have observed, <laughs> then you would say that okay, this is significant. But there is a we, but we run into multiple comparison fallacy very, very often in building models, especially when you try very hard. You randomly uh, try 100 things, then a few of them will turn, into be, turn out to be significant, statistically speaking. But that's because you try too many things. So here the philosophy is that uh, uh, think more and uh, try less. So the next one is this is secret. So this is the secret slide. So, I always, so some people ask me, what's the... The secret of doing well in uh, CAD competition. This is all the secret. So uh, there are a longer version on the left and the shorter version on the right. So uh, OK, the slides will be uh, posted somewhere, like uh, either on uh, Vivian's uh, website or in the slash share. So you, there's, no reason, there's no need to take notes on the, on the, on the slides content. So um, the shorter version is that why you need to be disciplined. So the temptation to overfit the public the body is actually very strong. Some, I, I can't, Sometimes uh, psychologically, I cannot control myself, but just to pop, just to overfit the public leaderboard because that makes me feel good. <laughs> okay, we are all, uh, we are human. I mean, this is a, but we need to be disciplined and remember ourselves. We don't want to look uh, a little bit embarrassed after the private leaderboard comes out, right? So you know, if you do so well on the public leaderboard, then it flips and they say, ah, oh, you couldn't find yourself anymore. Uh, it doesn't look good. So um, the next is work is to uh, work hard. Uh, Kaggle, at least on Kaggle, Kaggle's system rewards uh, effort. You never lose anything by, by participating. So you can, you, can, you can rank the absolute last on a contest, then you're still, relatively speaking, doing be do better than not participating. So usually you're participating more um, get you better results. And even within a competition, as long as you're disciplined, trying to work hard is always uh, helpful. And we will touch on that. Uh, on how to properly work hard later. The next one is uh, learn from uh, everyone. Uh, this also is a little bit against the human nature. So uh, we, all, we, we all have our own pride, right? So uh, occasionally, I would think, OK, this time I will just try to do everything myself. And so I, I, I don't want to look at how other people do it. And uh, it's, there is a, a little bit like hubris in there. Uh, but on the other hand, that People other than you always know better than you individually, right? So because there are so many of them, and they only want you, right? So it's, it's pretty hard to compete against everybody. So I, I'm, I'm just, I always feel that it's really learning from others that you can uh, really improve. And there's really no pride in like doing something by yourself. Otherwise, uh, actually, I'm not sure how many people can really invent all the mathematics that you learned in elementary school. And I think that takes more than one lifetime to invent all that. So there's really no such something as, oh, I learned this myself. The next one is luck. So uh, we, are, we are predicting, you're, a lot of times that we are predicting very noisy data and on things that we haven't seen yet. And there's really no, uh, there's no absolute differentiator between noise and the signal. There's not. So the only way to de really differentiate them is that you have more data, which for a data science competition, there's not. You have that much data. There is a signal to noise ratio that's pretty determined. So there's no, there's always non-zero luck. So if you participate in something and you you know don't do very well in a particular competition, so just that's probably just bad luck. But if you, if you do well, that's all your efforts. 
<laughs> That's how I see it. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I always get reminded, before I go to uh, give a presentation, I always get reminded, make sure that I bring something uh, concrete, you know, people can take away, right? So this, the, the rest of the, uh, the presentation is something that is more concrete. But I really, but uh, I, I personally really feel that is how you approach the problem. It's actually the, 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 the philosophy uh, and the strategy is actually uh, actually more important than specific techniques. So that I, I don't want to say that, oh, just learn other techniques, then you will do well. Actually, let me go back to, to a previous slide. So a lot of times that uh, it's not about uh, which one you do, right? So uh, there are a lot of specific things that you that uh, you know is necessary to do well to build a good model. It does not need to be a competition. Even in reality, you want to build a good model, you probably need all these as well. The the key there is actually how to allocate your your effort. We all have a time budget. You know, there's a deadline, and then we have to uh, do our day job and uh, feed our kids, and if you have kids, uh, so uh, there's only a limited number of hours per day. So it's actually worth it to think about how much how, how much time you want to allocate into doing feature engineering, how much time you want to allocate into uh, trying different form models, and uh, how much you want to allocate to uh, doing hyperparameter tuning. So you, you actually, I, I do think about it consciously. Now back to our uh, technical tricks. So these are concrete stuff. So gradient boosting, gradient boosting machines. Uh, I uh, I use I use GBM on everything that I can use GBM on. There are things that you can't GBM. Um, so one example would be uh, uh, very large data. If you have you know 100 million observations, you you probably don't want to run GBM. Uh, but for anything that I can GBM, I GBM. I probably uh, overuse GBM. Uh, the why GBM is uh, is so good. And I think by now probably uh, most people already know GBM already, but I let me cover that anyways in case. So GBM automatically captures to a very large degree nonlinear transformations and uh, subtle and deep interactions in your features. So uh, GBM also gracefully trace missing values. So uh, I, mean, this, uh, I use the R implementation of GBM. This is a package GBM very often. They actually, they are actually four, they actually at least four very good GBM implementations today. Actually, that's like, like two years ago, there was, on, there was only the R one that was good. But nowadays, you can use either the R package, you can use the, the, SK, uh, the SK Learn package, or GBM, that's also very good. And if you want to go parallel, you can use either the H2O version, or you can use XD Boost. They are all very good implementations, and each has their own uh, kind of curve. But they all are able to uh, do linear, non-linear transformation the interactions. Uh, so th these are actually, those two things actually are, pe are what people spend most of their time on when we are building uh, linear models or generalized linear models. So you know, in the days when we only had like a logistic regression or when we had only a Poisson regression, uh, in, uh, in the industry that uh, in insurance like we work. So we spend actually, uh, whenever we're building models, we are not really building models because we are really always run the loss of Poisson or gamma regression. So it's always the same model. So what we are doing is look at all the outliers, all the, all the transformations, either the U-shaped, uh, like W-shaped, uh, whatever shaped, uh, hockey stick shaped, or we, uh, we try to do this interaction, that interaction. If you use GBM, all those things are taken care of for you, for you, taken care of for you automatically. That's why I use it so much. So if you haven't tried, please do try. <laughs> so uh, GBM, like everything, uh, like all the other like modern machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, it has a few tuning parameters. And uh, when your data is pretty, when your data size is small, you can just do great search. But uh, actually, GBM has uh, actually three separate uh, pretty orthogonal tuning parameters. If you want to do grid search, actually, you actually do need a pretty big grid. So uh, I, but, uh, I, I usually use some uh, rule of thumb kind of tuning, so it, it's mostly for saving time. So if you do a very smart grid search, you can probably do better than the rule of thumb. But rule of thumb is you know, very uh, time, uh, time, time saving. So 
The first set of tuning parameter is how many trees you want to build and the learning rate. They are reciprocal to each other. So higher learning rate will get you to use less number of trees. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I won't save time, right? So usually I just target 500 or 1,000 trees and tune the learning rate. You know, start from 0 0.1 and then we'll go up and down a little bit. Uh, the next one is, uh, uh, is just the, a common uh, tuning parameter for the decision trees. So GBM is based on decision trees, so it needs the decision tree parameters. The number of observations in the leaf node. So usually that, I just look at the data, you can get a feel of how many observations that you need to get a good mean estimate. So if your data is very noisy, then you may need more. If your data is pretty stable, you probably need less. So just use that number. Actually, I feel that's actually uh, you really turn out to be pretty good. And the interaction depth. Uh, this interaction depth is, uh, is a very interesting thing for, uh, for the R version of the GBM. The R version of the GBM interaction depth basically describes how many uh, split it does. So it's not an interaction depth as in the tree depth. If you have an interaction depth of 11, so that means you have 10 leaf nodes, actually, about 10 leaf nodes. It doesn't mean that you have 1,000 leaf nodes. So uh, it's, don't be afraid to use 10. I use 10 very often. Uh, so there's one thing that uh, uh, the GBM that doesn't do. Actually, there's one thing that uh, all the tree-based algorithms do not do well, which is uh, dealing with uh, uh, high cardinality categorical features. So if you have a feature that has, a, which is a categorical variable, that has many, many levels, uh, throwing them into anything tree-based is a bad idea because uh, uh, tree will either run super slowly if you want hot encoding all of them or uh, explode uh, or just overuse that feature because it's overfitted. So for high cardinality features, you don't use them in the tree. You have to somehow encode them as uh, numerical features. Uh, there are a few different ways of uh, encoding. So uh, I just want to mention that they actually high cardinality features are very often. Uh, we often see them like, a, like zip code, or if you do uh, medical data, you see a diagnosis code. There are tens of thousands of CD9s. Uh, our text features, they are all very high cardinality features. So one, one approach of uh, encoding them is actually build a you can build a regression, you can build a ridge regression. Just to do a, you know, especially in a logistic case, it's very simple. Add L2 penalty to your logistic regression to based on your categorical features. And then you can then use that prediction itself. That would be a numerical as an input to your, uh, to your GBM. I will, I will cover more detail for a particular example of how I do this. So uh, it's, it's actually a pretty standard idea. So that's uh, what usually people call a stacking. So basically you build like a, a stack of different models. And the subsequent stage of models will use the previous stage models uh, as uh, output as, as their input. So as I described, if you have text features, you have numerical features. You get all the text features into your, your rich regression model. And then you will make a prediction. <coughs> And then you put that prediction uh, uh, side by side with all your raw numerical features, and then feed this into a into a GBM. And this usually works pretty well. And uh, if you haven't tried, it, then if you you can this can you can replace this by like a categorical features. You can do that too. And uh, for a lot of Kaggle competitions, you just do this. You rank like a top. Of, 25% at least. So, 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 so for people, so people who rank at the bottom half of Kaggle usually don't use GBM. That's what I think of them. <laughs> <laughs> because it's actually quite easy to rank uh, like a top half. Um, there are many like beginners or people who, who, are, who, are, who like uh, really get into this on the bottom half actually. Mm. So the one particular, uh, uh, Risk here is that if you use the same data to do this, you use the same data to build the, the, the first stage model and then use the same data again on the, 
on the GPM model, on the model two. Uh, a, a very often, the prediction one will be overfitting uh, in your model two because the prediction one is already you already used the target variable once using prediction one. So whenever you so prediction one has the leakage in there, so basically it has leaked the information from an actual target. So whenever you put the prediction one like that together with numerical features, the prediction one will be given too much weight. And the more you overfit the model one, the more uh, weight it will be given to prediction one. So actually, it's, it's, it, it can be quite bad. So what you want to do here is that uh, you always want to use different data for, uh, for model one and the model two. So you always want to use different data. So you can split your data in half. Use a half data for model one and a half data model two. And that usually gives you a better model than uh, using the, all the data for model one, all the data for model two. And you can swap them. You can use like a split your data into half of its A, half is B. Use A to build the model one and then build a model two on B, and then use B to build the model one and build another model one, model two on A. You have to do that. So you can use all the data that way. Uh, then you, uh, that seriously give very good results usually. And in if if you are not trying to win a competition, right? So in in for practical purposes, actually I feel that kind of model is already good enough. Yeah, for, for a lot of practical applications. So okay, here. So also you can take this one step further. If you have a smaller data, then uh, even doing half half maybe. Uh, limiting your data too much, you can actually do something like cross-validation. You can split your data into 10 folds and do 10 different model ones. Each one using nine predicted the other one. Then you can, you can then uh, concatenate all the models together so that each record will have an out-of-sample prediction from model one. Then you can avoid the overfitting problem in the model two. So that's how you, you deal with the categorical features. Once you can, <coughs> once you can deal with uh, categorical features, I mean GBM is uh, is is good for ninety five percent of general predictive modeling cases. You can make a GBM model a little bit better. So by a little bit better, you mean that you can get a you know a little bit higher category ranking, maybe get a one percent higher AOC. It may or may not be worth it for you, depending on the problem. Uh, the the reason is GBM can only approximate interactions and uh, transformations. So it, uh, when it approximating, when GBM is approximating the transformation or interactions, it can't really differentiate noise versus uh, signal, so that it inevitably pick up some noise. So if you know that you have a certain uh, nonlinearity in your model, you have if you know that there are strong interactions, it's actually better uh, to uh, explicitly code them, and then put them into GBM. We are still using GBM. The next one is that um, the GBM's uh, mod, the feature engineering is just a, a greedy, space, greedy space search, so that it can't really find the very specific transformations. So uh, for example, a lot of times when we build a, uh, like a sales forecasting model, so the best sales forecaster is actually the previous uh, time period sales. So if you want GBM to automatically discover that, I think actually that's pretty, pretty difficult. So if you know that, definitely. So that covers the GBM. Uh, the, the second most often used tool by me is actually uh, uh, the linear models, so like the generalized linear models or regularized generalized linear models. Uh, I, I used to use uh, Glimnet very often. That is, uh, in the, it's also a very popular R package. The, so, from a methodology perspective, uh, GlimNet is actually uh, all the all the generalized linear models are kind of uh, opposite of GBM. So all the generalized linear models uh, are global models, so assuming everything is linear, and all the tree models are local models, and imagine every uh, assuming everything is a staircase shape. So they complement each other very well. The linear models become become quite important. When your data is very very small, or when your data is very very big, so reason for different reasons. So for for your when your data is very very small, um, the 
you you just don't have enough signal to support uh, nonlinear relationship for our interactions. It's not that there isn't. There always is nonlinear relationship for interactions. But if you have don't have enough data to detect them, it's better to stick with the simpler one. So that's when uh, the linear model works well. On the other end of the spectrum, when you really have you know billions and billions of observations, uh, only linear models are fast enough for you. So everything else will never finish in your in our lifetime. So that's why you do, you're going back to linear model when data are very large. So the the linear models. Uh, when you do a model blend, I will cover model blend a little bit later. So when you average, basically, you blend the models together, GBM and GlimNet complement each other very well, so you get a very uh, nice boost in performance. The downside of, uh, of uh, GlimNet or anything similar to this kind of model is that it requires a lot of work. So that all the things that GBM does for us automatically, uh, I have to do that myself. I have to deal with all the missing values, all the outliers, all the transformations and interactions. Uh, it really takes a lot of time. And the last thing uh, I want to cover is uh, the regularization. Uh, so, uh, my, my my this is my personal uh, uh, how I say that bias is this. You know, in this day and age, if you are building uh, linear models uh, without any regularization, then you must be really special. That that's really how I think. Right? So it's, it's, it's seriously. So uh, if you are building a linear model without the regularization, that you must be working somewhere really special. So always regularize. So uh, it's, it's required. So there are two very popular uh, regularization approach. One is L1, one is L2. So basically, L1 gives you sparse models. L2 just make uh, everything's parameter a little bit smaller. The, the sparsity assumption uh, is a very good assumption. So actually, the, the book uh, called the Elements of Statistical Learning, that's a very good book. It actually discusses why that is the case. So the reason is almost like a, like a Pascal's wager, right? and you know I don't know how many of you know that, but the, the point is, if your problem is sparse in nature, assuming sparsity will get you much better model than not assuming it. If your if your problem is not sparse in nature, then assuming it wouldn't hurt much. So the lesson is always assume sparsity. Uh, <laughs> always assume. Unless, unless, there's always exception to the rule. Unless there is a problem you know is not sparse. So the actually problem that we know is not sparse. So things like, um, uh, like tax money, or if you are doing some sort of like, uh, uh, like zip code, if you build a zip code based model, then if you think what is sparse in the sense of a geographical uh, distribution, that means like there are three zip codes that are special. They have some kind of parameters, and everything else is the same. So that's the same thing like in text mining. If you assume that like, uh, that 500 words in the English language is very special, and then all the other like 100,000 is not useful, that's not possible. So in that case, uh, when you're doing text mining or doing very uh, high cardinality categoricals, that's why you do not assume sparsity. But other than that, it's pretty safe to assume it's sparse. So let's go to text mining a little bit. Uh, so first, I admit that I'm not a very uh, good uh, text miner, if that's a word. I just, you know, I, I, I read, I Google things, and I read whatever other people write, and then I try to follow their examples. Um, so my, uh, my approach to text mining is the simpler stuff usually works better. Uh, as, you know, as far as we have come on the you know, machine learning, the n-gram based approaches, uh, n-gram and naive base based approaches actually work surprisingly well, and a lot of times actually it's quite hard to uh, to do better. So uh, here on text mining is always uh, you know my, my 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 view is make sure you get the basics, the advanced stuff uh, it's 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 less likely to work. The basics such as n-grams and also the trivial features such as like, how long the text is. Uh, how many words in the text, and um, uh, if there is any punctuation stuff. Those kind of uh, features are actually very important. And uh, the last one is uh, a lot of uh, problems that are heavy on text uh, are not necessarily uh, driven by text. 
So uh, this year is a KDD cup actually is an interesting example. So the KDD cup uh, is a problem. It's also it's actually sponsored by a New York based uh, uh, company. They do uh, uh, they have a website that website where you can donate to your local schools teachers projects. So if you are a teacher in the elementary school or high school, you can post projects saying I'm doing this reading club with my uh, my students. I need one hundred dollars to buy this carpet. You know, people really post those. And then, uh, if you find, uh, if you sympathize with that effort, you say, "I give you one hundred dollars." You can give ten. People can add together. So they call it donor choose, so that as a donor, you can choose which product is sponsored. So they set up the competition uh, to see which company, which project is more likely to get attention from people and more likely to be funding. Uh, so the teachers will put up. Uh, Essays and the summaries of their projects. So it's a very nicely written essay. Some people write very nice essays, not everybody. And so that all the text data are provided, also together with the cost and type of project. And so that you know there are not so many texts, right? If you look at the data, you know whenever you have unstructured data, the the text always is way bigger than the than the structured data. So that you you know I always feel that I am obligated to you know use the text a lot. But uh, it turns out that uh, essentially the some other features are more, much more important. So, for example, uh, projects that cost less are much more likely to be funded. <laughs> so that doesn't need the essay to tell you. You know, if you if you ask people one, for one thousand dollars for a laptop, you know, no essay will save you. <laughs> so it's much easier to ask for people for math books. <laughs> that's 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 how the data tells us. If that's right or wrong? I don't know. So next one is blending. So if you uh, spend, a, if you do one competition on Kaggle, uh, <coughs> then you will learn this. So it's almost never, it's, um, it's um, almost never, that a single, a single model will win a competition. People always build a variety of models and uh, uh, blend them. Blend, blending is just a fancy word for weighted average of models. And you can, you can do, you can do a little bit fancier than weighted <laughs> average, but not that much. I usually just use weighted average. So my 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 rationalization for why blending works is that because uh, all our models are, are wrong. So as George Box said, that all models are wrong. Some are useful. And there are lots of good sayings in statistics. So I like this one very much. All models are wrong, and some but some are useful. I would like to think that all models are wrong, but mine are useful. Uh, <laughs> but there's also another one that I would like to mention, which is this. It's, uh, I think I forgot who said that. It's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. I forgot who said that. This was a very good thing. Yeah, yeah so, so that's right. So, so, the, 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 so like when, we, when we study regression analysis or something similar uh, in school, we always uh, Start uh, our models with the IID Gaussian assumption, like uh, in independently identically distributed Gaussian errors, right? So, in my entire life, I have never seen a real data set with that distribution. Let's put that way, okay? <laughs> Just, it never happened. I, I don't know where it should happen, but it never happened. So, our assumptions are never right. So, whatever you assume, unless you are doing a simulated data set, you know, unless that, that is always wrong. So, so the hope of that is that. Uh, our models are wrong in different ways, so that when you average them, their their wrongness kind of cancel out each uh, cancel each other out. So that's that's how I justify why it works. There are a few things um, uh, to keep in mind. One is like a simpler is usually better when things are uncertain. So if you are not sure, just uh, just add model one, model two, model three divided by three. That's that's usually better than you know. Uh, to, uh, you know, taking the parameters, unless you have a lot of data. And the next one is that the, there is a useful strategy, which is intentionally overfit the public leaderboard. And if you do it uh, carefully, actually, it may give you a nice boost. So you, what you want to do is this. You build many different models, and you submit them to the public leaderboard individually. And then uh, you, based on their score, you keep the better ones. And then average them, and that's your plan. Uh, so this actually, uh, <clears throat> at least on public leaderboard, that will give you a nice boost. You know, this model definitely work on, work better than any individual model you submitted. So either that will work better on the private leaderboard or not depends on how much data you have. 
on the public leaderboard. So if you have a lot of data on public leaderboard, actually this will help you. Because when you're doing this, you are actually uh, implicitly using the public leaderboard data as your training data. So you, are, so you, you actually have an advantage over people who don't do this, a real advantage, if the public leaderboard data is large enough. But if it's not large enough, you're just overfitting public leaderboard. You will do terribly bad when that thing comes out on private. So it's, uh, it's totally based on data volume. One thing that's very useful in building blending is actually you are not going after the strongest individual model. You want a model that, uh, always you want a model that work, but you want a model that different. Sometimes actually intentionally build uh, weak models uh, help uh, a lot when you add them to a strong model. So the key is the diversity. I'm sure HR people will be very happy to hear this. You know, we, we need diversity in model building. So it's, this is true. This is actually scientifically uh, proven. It's good. So you can, there are many ways of building diverse models. So here's a few uh, examples, um, the infinite ways of doing this. So you, you can use different tools. You can use different model structures. Uh, you can use uh, different subsets of features. You can use uh, different subsample of observations. You can build models that are for weighted problem. You can build both weighted and unweighted models. Usually the unweighted one would work worse than the weighted one if you have a weighted problem. But uh, if you can take 90% of a weighted model and 10% of the unweighted, it will work better than the 100% weighted. Uh, it's quite often. The, but uh, here is uh, try to build those models uh, more or less blindly. Don't look at the answer. You know, the, the public interval is just hanging there and you always want to test them. Try not to use that as a guide to uh, filter out your models unless you are confident that the data set is large enough so that you can actually use that way. So that's, it's a total judgment call based on the noisiness and the size of data. Um, before I go to the real examples, I will, let me hope I have one. Okay, I have an example. Let me uh, try to address this uh, question uh, uh, objectively, although it's not possible because everybody's best. So people ask, sometimes people ask me that, uh, I, I, I certainly I enjoy, you can tell I enjoy doing competitions, right? So, uh, uh, so it, other than being a fun game, is, is there anything really useful for competitions? Uh, so first of all, let's acknowledge that it's a fun game, right? So, you know, fun game itself is entertaining, so that's real usefulness. So we shouldn't dismiss fun game as something not useful. But beyond that, uh, there are two ways of looking at this. So the model in competition only covers actually a very small portion of the necessary work to make a data science really useful in this world. So in order to make that, uh, to make data, to make a model really useful, we need at least uh, another three pieces. So why that we need to select the right problem to solve. So if you find a problem that is interesting only in abstract way, but there's no real world implement, real world implication, there's, there's actually no immediate value. The next one is that we need to have good data. So uh, the model certainly is a, is a garbage in garbage out problem. So if you don't have good data, you, you cannot uh, expect to have good models. The third one is that we need to make sure that the models are used the right way. So a lot of times that it's possible to build very good models, but then they are implemented wrong. It can be trivially wrong. It happened to me in the past that you, uh, we build a pricing model in insurance, and then uh, you implement this swap, the parameters in the model. It's like uh, X1's parameter goes to X2, and then you figure out, oh, this doesn't work. Then you, go, you say, oh, they swapped it. I, I really want to ask why they swapped it, but they do. So, uh, so with all these three, plus the right generalizable model, then you will have a right solution. So uh, building the model, the fun part of building the model like Kaggle is only a small part. We, we all need to keep that in mind in, the, in reality. Uh, but that said, you know, competition uh, help us in many different ways. So I have two ways that help the sponsor. So if you have a company, uh, either a startup company or an uh, enterprise, uh, building a, doing a modern competition for your own data set is very helpful. So, so two ways that helps you is one, one is to help you some like measure to a degree the signal versus noise in your data. So if you put up a reasonable price money, then you can be quite sure that 99% of all the signal that you can squeeze out of your data will be squeezed out by the people on Kaggle. Kaggle people are quite good at that. And the, the second one 
is if there's any flaws in your data. So it's a lot of times based because of the data collection process issues, you may have predictors that are not real predictors, such as you know if some if a particular field is missing, you always have a you know a yes or no as an answer. So if you have anything like that, the Kaggle Cloud will find it for you, and you can go back and fix. The model is not useful if you have that problem, but at least you can fix your data. But as a, as a, as a participant, so um, I learned two things, among others, two major things from Kaggle. One is that uh, I have to build generalizable models. You know, just predicting what I know is useless. That discipline actually is, is, is hard to learn discipline. The next one is to, to fully realize day to day, every, every day basically, that uh, there are other approaches, there are other, bad, other people with better ideas. So it's always keep me on my toes and uh, keep me uh, learning new things. Otherwise, you know, it's quite easy to just hide in my corner thing. Oh, I do really good modeling work. So, <laughs> and then I go there and I try to say, "Oh, I'm an idiot." I feel that it happens quite often. So uh, let me uh, just give two examples of uh, uh, of uh, two competition, like two competition that I did uh, okay well. Um, so why is the Amazon uh, user access uh, competition? So this is uh, this is what. This is one of the most popular competitions. It used to be the most popular, but recently the, the Higgs competition has more participants. So this one has about 1,700 teams participating. Uh, I, I got second place on this one. Um, I was, th this actually is one of the interesting experiences for me, because I was number one on the public leaderboard, and I didn't try to overfit the public leaderboard. Sometimes I do, so this time I didn't try. And then uh, I still lost somehow to another team. Uh, never figure out why. <laughs> so, uh, so the problem is to use anonymized features to predict if uh, an employee access request will be granted or denied. If you work in a fairly large company, this is very often, right? So you, I need to accept that folder, then somebody might say yes or no. And all the features are categorical. So they are basically like resource IDs, manager IDs, user IDs, department IDs, and then one, two, three, four, all numbers. Uh, and the many features have many, many levels. but. Uh, but I want to use GBM, right? So this is where how you I convert all the categorical features into uh, numerical. So there are two ways that I use to encode the categorical feature into uh, into numerical. One is like uh, how many times that level appears in the data set, and you can do this for all your categorical features and all the interactions for categorical features. And then another one is use the average response. So Basically, average y for that level as a predictor. So here you have to do something slightly more complex than doing a straight average because straight average will lead to overfitting on thin levels. I will show an example on the next page. And then beyond those uh, in encodings, uh, this, uh, the final model is a uh, is a linear combination of uh, three different kind of trees uh, and plus the glimnet. And plus two subset features base traits. So this is a, a blend that at the end I tuned uh, uh, manually. At that time, I did not uh, uh, fully understand the online learners like uh, Wopa Wabbit. So I didn't use it. So in retrospect, if I use those kind of things, I think I will get a better model because they have a very different algorithm. So this, uh, this particular competition has a requirement that everybody has to publish, publish their code, so that uh, my code is up there on the GitHub. OK, don't, do not evaluate my software engineering skills when you read the code. <laughs> so here is, uh, the, this, is uh, this is something that is very easy to do, actually, for uh, encoding categorical features uh, uh, by doing mean the average response. So the data set is, uh, this is very uh, simple data set. So we have one categorical feature that you, uh, is a user ID. And it's uh, for the level A1, we have six observations. Four of them is in the training data, and two of them is in your test data. So for the training data, you have the response variable that's 0, 1, 1, 0. And the test data, you wouldn't have the response variable. So here shows how to encode them into a, how to encode this into a category, into a numerical. So what you do is to calculate for the training data, 
the average response for everything but that observation. So for the first one, it's a zero. The, for for this, this particular observation, there are three other observations in the same level. That's number two, three, four. And it's a two out of three. That's why it's a 0. 0.667. The second one, uh, it has it also has three other observations, but it's one zero zero, so it's point three three three. Do not use it itself. If you use it itself, then you will be overfitting uh, thin data. Sometimes it also helps that uh, to add a random a uh, noise onto your training set data. It helps you smooth over very frequently occurring. Uh, Values. For example, if you look at this, you will see that 0 0.67, 0 0.67, you know, 2.67 and 2.333. Actually, uh, when you throw those kind of things into GBM, actually GBM go nuts because it, it you know, it, it treats them as special, uh, uh, very, almost special values. So if you add a small noise on top of that, it actually makes it a little more real from a data perspective. You do not need any such, such special treatment for the testing data. Testing data is a straight average of the response value for that level for the training. So two out of four, that's point five. So this is all you need to do to uh, use uh, categorical features in GBM. This is actually much easier to do compared to build a separate rigid regression. And I, I do this very, very often. So, uh, so that's uh, Amazon. So Amazon, uh, Amazon computation is a very simple data set. Mostly just do feature engineering on anonymized categorical features. And the response is one or zero. So the all state computation uh, is, is unique in a different way that it has very structured target variables. So it has uh, seven correlated targets. So it's called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which rep represent the options people choose when people buy personal auto insurance, insurance uh, policies from all state. So you can choose like uh, you want a comprehensive coverage, you would want a hundred thousand uh, uh, limit on BI or PD or whatever. So this turned out to be a very difficult uh, competition for, for uh, two reasons. Actually, uh, a lot of people hate this competition a lot. So uh, one is that the evaluation criteria is all of nothing. So you have to predict all seven correctly to get a point. If you predict anything wrong, that's zero. So basically, partial answers got no credit for this one. Uh, people hate that a lot. We had a long debate on the on the Kaggle forum, but the, the Kaggle people didn't watch. So um, <laughs> next, I, I heard the story was even all state was upset with them. So <laughs> even the sponsor wasn't happy. So uh, the next one is uh, the baseline model. There is a trivial solution to this model, which is very good. Which is uh, the problem is to predict the final purchase option based on earlier transactions. But whichever uh, option they choose for their last known transaction is actually a very good predictor of the final purchase option. So, so the model is like, if you just use the trivial last quoted as the predictor, no change. It's right about 53.269%. You really need a lot of decimals to see the difference. That's why they're decimals. And then uh, I, got, I got the third place in the computation. So, I predict I'm, I'm able to improve that by a point four 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 percent, and then the number one solution improve them to improve another point oh three percent point four four. So we did. This is uh, I'm proud to say that this is statistically significantly better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's a business significantly better or not. That I don't know, but it's statistically speaking, significant. The challenge to this is actually uh, most on the target variable side. So the A, B, C, D, E, F, G are not independent of each other. Actually, every uh, one of them can be predicted very well, more than 90% accurate. But uh, when you put them together, they have actually quite interesting structures. And then the two challenges that capture the correlation and then not lose to the baseline. So, um, so, so I, I build chained models for, uh, for the dependency. So I first build a free studying F model. And then assume you know f, you build a g model. Then assume you, you build, you know f and g, and then you build the next and next, you build another. And you can actually change the order of models to put your free models first and dependent models later to uh, make the model better. Actually, this works quite well. And this is, uh, you know, in my way that it's a little bit more uh, uh, theoretically appealing because it's actually one systematic model. There's no like a hand tuning in like, oh, I want to put this combination, that combination. So the 
The next one is in order not to use lose the baseline, basically we build two state models. You build a, one model to decide either you want to use the baseline or you want to use your prediction. And then when you want to use your prediction, then you use your prediction. Otherwise, stick with baseline. So at least for the you know for the dummy cases that you do as well as the baseline, and for where you can find improvement, you improve up. So I think that's how you can improve up on a very strong baseline. So uh, to finish, there are a few uh, kind of trivially uh, useful pointers. So. Uh, one thing that I highly recommend is that to participate, if you want to learn how to build generalized models, really uh, participate in the competition. Just just watching it doesn't count. So uh, so from my own perspective is that uh, is the more frustrated I am doing it, the more I learn after. So uh, it's like uh, I couldn't solve this other people do so well. I really uh, really hate myself. But then I look at other people's answer and say, oh, that's how they did it. You you really get a very uh, Good learning experience that way. If you're just observing it as a spectator, I, I really don't get into the problems. And really read the forums. So people really post very useful notes. And uh, that's the very good. Uh, they also post like links to papers, to books. And next one is um, OK, I, I need to admit that I have no PhD. Uh, so uh, my, my education was in, in, in engineering. It's related, but it was neither in statistics nor in uh, computer science. So I learned a lot of just basically reading books and reading Kaggle forums. So one book that is very good is the Elements of Statistical Learning from uh, the Stanford guys. So highly recommend it. You just test like uh, uh, the, 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 the Bible of machine learning, but uh, in a way that. So if you, it's also freely available, legitimately, on the internet. <laughs> hey, you know, a lot of things are freely available on the internet, but not legitimately. <laughs> This is legitimately pretty valuable, so please take a look. It covers a really a this very good survey book for the statistical learning uh, approaches. The next one, other trivial, other pretty simple ones such as the uh, circuit case, uh, the circuit learn package in Python, uh, Cron, and then uh, things like Wapa Wapit. Wapa Wapit actually is quite useful. I've been using that a lot recently. So with that, and uh, hopefully I didn't you know hold the guys for too long. Thank you. So we can take five questions. Right. It has to be good one. Otherwise, otherwise, you're banned from this group, OK? <laughs> All right, OK. Two. Two. Oh, that's it. Uh, <laughs> well, the first one one. OK, so my second question is, what's your take on using neural networks in competition for tasks that aren't oh. well screen neural networks like um, image or audio? Oh. If you are if you are doing image recognition, please use a convolutional neural network. Yeah. Otherwise, you're dead. Just don't don't even try other anything else. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so I, th I think even for other competitions, you can use neural network. But I think neural network has the advantage, has the disadvantage, other than the other than the CNNs. Uh, in in the general problems is that neural network has been out of fashion for a while. So there there aren't a lot of very good packages to build like a uh, regular neural networks outside of the convolutional stuff. I think that's why it's not as common. Is it is, sir? Okay. Question? No? I have a question. Okay, all right. So uh, in the private leaderboard, when they give the test data, right? Yeah. If they have some fields with the data, like NA or something, when you develop the model, it will eliminate those things. But is there a situation where the data set given doesn't contain any of those things, but the actual data will contain it? So do we need to think through all those situations and mitigate those things, or how does it work? Uh, what kind of things do you do? Me on the feature side, or on the target side. So, what is the smaller training data set they provide? Yeah. Assuming that contains no NA value, so we create a model for that oh. without uh, mitigating those factors. But what if the original data contains those things? So, do we need to think through all those things? Uh, yes, you do. So, because you are always given the the predictors right. for the for the, for the private leaderboard, so you can tell if there are NAs or not. So if there are no enemies, there's nothing to worry about. So they won't, so which means as long as the original uh, full data set contains an NA, then in the training set also, they will provide those things. But not necessarily. You can have a field that which has absolutely no NAs in the, uh, in the training, and then there are NAs in the, in the So which means for every field, I may need to uh, 
mitigate or uh, do that? Uh, no, you, you, you are providing the private data for data, so you can tell if there are If there are analysts, you have to treat them. But if there isn't, you don't need to worry about it. So you don't need to guess in that one. But what if my model will not work in the, in the original data, which contains any? Because I worked on a model from the private data which contains only uh, without any. You are given all the data on the predictor side, so there's no uncertainty in that one. Okay. If we can cover this later, a more detail you can see. Okay. Okay. Question? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> in my experience, you went through a couple different things. One is a choice of different models and blending models, and the other is kind of feature engineering and all that. In my experience, it's the feature engineering that gets you more of a distance toward the goal. Better models can give you the last little distance. Mm -hmm. But like, especially in, in business applications, where you know, to win a Kaggle competition, you know, there's very fine differences, mm -hmm. between, as you were saying, between the top people. Mm -hmm. In business, the difference between GBM versus trees versus Lasso Ridge, whatever, mm -hmm. for me is less uh, gets is less important than maybe than getting you know one hot encoding of different predictors and kind of making sure that you're running your your analysis on the right variables. But what's your opinion? Uh, that's almost like to, to it's almost like like a food and water which more which one is more important for survival, right? So it's both necessary. So uh, I. I, I, well, I want to agree with you that I think that in a lot of cases that the, the feature engineering is, is certainly very important, especially if you know that uh, there are good feature engineering for that particular problem. But I think uh, in, a lot of time, in a lot of situations that the, the line between model and feature engineering is not really that clear. So that, that in the case of GPM, it actually does uh, uh, interaction for you. So that makes it much less less necessary for you to identify the interactions. So it's so it's basically it's actually quite likely that the, for predicting problems, CBM with no feature engineering will actually beat the logistic regression with feature engineering. It's by, by actually by a reasonable margin. So that's uh, basically that's how how I, how, I, how I feel about it. I think it's problem specific. Okay, that's that's not the answer. <laughs> okay. right. Do you have any thoughts on like for online learning whether you use the linear models or you use some like Bayesian techniques? I have no idea about the online Bayesian techniques actually, so I can't comment on that. So I use a lot of the like the like the follow the regression leader kind of for online learning stuff. So don't worry. Too so many questions. Okay, alright. A lot of times we have the requirement of using the same model both predict and whether it explains the driving factors. Right? Oh. And sometimes they will not be the right ones because the predictors might not make really sense. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times we are in this situation where we don't know whether to do a negative model or not. Yeah. So what do you, how do you suggest addressing that maybe with the teams or anybody they're working with? Oh, OK. So uh, first, on Kaggle, we have the luxury of not even not needing to explain anything, okay? So, so the, that's one thing that's a good thing. Now, in reality, that uh, it's, it's actually not, not, it's actually quite common to build models uh, to have one prediction model, but another separate, different, simpler uh, interpretation model. Actually, if that is at all possible, I think that might be a reasonable approach. Uh, beyond that, that really depends on what your model's purpose is. There are two kinds of models, actually. So to think about predictive supervised learning, supervised predictive model, there are two kinds of models. One is uh, you only need to predict it, predict it outcome. In that case, uh, you know, one example would be like pricing in insurance. So you just need to know predicted outcome, uh, who is more likely to have accident. In that case, uh, complex model is very acceptable. But there's another kind of model, which is more, it's kind of like interventional model. Based on whatever your model says, that you want to do something different. So in that case, you actually uh, you are actually leaving the predictive modeling and into the causality study. In that case, it's strongly preferred to use simpler, simpler models. And avoid at all costs of complex interactions, because uh, uh, there's no way to differentiate, actually. There's, it's very difficult to differentiate the correlation and the causality uh, in observational data only. So simplified model is much better in that way. So it depends on the purpose. How many questions do we have? One question. 
Uh, girl first? Any more girls? There are two ways of doing time series. So uh, one is the proper time series way, which is all linear models. All the, all the proper time series packages are linear models fundamentally. And the other way is to convert a time series problem into a non-time series problem and DBM it. <laughs> cool. I think we have to wrap up here. If you have more questions, welcome to chat with yeah, Owen. Yes. Uh, I find the same thing. Want to teach how to do city bike prediction? How to predict how many bike and dogs will be there in five, ten, fifteen uh, minutes? Okay. The last five minutes actually give the best prediction. I use GBM. <laughs> I use time series. Of I use all yeah. kind of that's, that's the techniques. It's a very hard to beat the baseline problem. Yeah. Okay. Guys, we have a traditional way to evaluate tonight's speaker's performance. We're going to vote for him. So this means he's awesome. This means he's super awesome. This means you don't want to see him again. So let's see. <laughs> Owen, can you turn around? So you only look at me. All right. Can you, can you OK, yeah. OK, guys, we're voting. Honest, OK? OK. I will show you later. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Wow. You have all the hands in the air. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think we have, uh, we do have a request from the, our host of this location that if you have any plates or cans or things, please take them uh, and put them in the, in the, in the trash can because they have a uh, as Anna said, there is a very early session tomorrow, so whatever we can do to help them clean up. Highly appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you have a question, Matthew. You don't need to. I know, I know. I wanted to help you with an amazing success. Come on, it's very simple. I know, it's just a couple things I don't understand, right? I don't understand. Yeah, I was going to ask you yeah, to comment on um, you know, what your experience is on posterior influence. Yeah. Even exactly. Yeah. So that actually got yeah. all the way. Oh, it was. Yeah. I actually used that. Actually, I tried to watch the spam. It's probably lost a lot of the so, uh, although uh, I'm very really never uh, in the same team, because the title comes to mind. Well, the team and analysis and mental framework are very good. So, my question is how do you do this? Is it possible that you have a name for like a of nine nine nine? No, that's just a straight average of uh, what are you averaging? Oh, maybe not that. It's the average response of all these in the same level in training. Oh, Arrow, okay. Average of 0, 1, 1, 0 is 1, 1. So, like, if this was, if these were all A2, mm -hmm. then for A2 it would be 0. 0.3, 3, and then this one would be 1. So, if, so, uh, so if that A2, then it will be 0. 0.66 6 because you have two ones and one zero. Okay. So it's basically for for test data, you just go to look at these two will always have same value because they are the same level. And right. you go back to in the training, get all those A ones and average these. For A two, you just uh, average all the A twos in training. Okay. It's pretty simple. Just that's a straight average. Okay. Bottom training. And how many hours for uh, calculus competition for you to win one? 
how big are your EC2 instances? Uh, actually, I don't use any. I have a pretty good computer at home, but it does take, to do well in a competition, it probably take at least a few hundred hours. A few hundred hours. Yeah. Okay. This is a lot of effort. Okay. What, what is the intuition behind using the mean of the response for the other? Oh, there is actually a, there is an intuition, so it might be retrospectively created intuition, right? So, so it's like this. What the, the idea is to make uh, the training data as similar as possible as the test data. So if you think about it, uh, when you look at this record, you are trying to use something on other records because it doesn't have its own one. You are trying to use information on other records to predict this. So you want to do the same for training. That's why for every record, you want to use other records to predict it. So that's the intuition. So how, how does it help in the, the test set when it's, it's all going to be 0.5, wouldn't it? Yeah, but for A2, it will be different. So this is because, uh, so this is user ID. A1 is only one user ID. This user has six observations. So A2 will have another 10 observations. And A2 may have only a point, point 0.2 average, then it might be point 0.2 for A2. So they just convert uh, categorical into numerical. So every particular level will always map to the same value in time. So this is in a sense dimensionality reduction. Right? So I was wondering what other techniques we use. Like when you have a lot of features and you have to space to reduce. Yeah, I, I always try PCA, but it never worked for me. <laughs> 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 you also I tried like that PCA. So I, I tried that too. Uh, uh, it's actually uh, the dumber one, like similar ones, may actually work sometimes. So uh, such as. Uh, to one-way correlation, and then keep the more important ones. Oh, it actually works. That's dumb. That's very stupid, really but it works. But that works. Sometimes it works better than PCA. PCA well, you, can never work too well. You're losing some data when you're you PCA. So. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. make it also faster. You're losing right? Right? Right. That's when you're doing text, yes, the speed you you by, by, by definition, you're going to lose 90% or something. No, it never. So in text mining, the I also regularizer is at 5 Oh, okay. Hopefully, that's more. You know, you can sense that. Uh, like yeah, I also, I, I also yeah. it's more like a supervised. Yeah. 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 I already think it's work, but it never works. Maybe I'll I'll retire. I'm not too bad. So, I have a question about the all-state yeah. uh, competition. Yeah. I, I participated in it, and I was going the direction that you went in. Uh, so I, I get far. Uh, how did you decide to use F first and then to change it that way? Yeah, F seems to be le least dependent on others. I translate the two-way correlation of all the Yes. Pairs. Yes. And F is the least correlated with anything else. Uh, so that's the least that. correlated yeah. one, and then and then well, which are one that is lit. So the most correlated one is at the end. Okay. So so that's how there's a, like there are pairs of correlations with like a C and D and B and A and G and something. Right, right, right. And so and I ordered them that way. Right. So generate features for that problem because I think the sequences were different for each person. Right? So. So that's kind of like yeah, the input space is different yeah. for each person. Yeah, yeah so yeah. you it's have to collapse that into uh, so there's like a last transaction, previous transaction, right, right, right. and also like a, if the last transaction is the same as the previous transaction, or uh, if they are similar for the, the two before, uh, how many they had, all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, to, how to roll up transactions into a one row is actually always manual. There's, I couldn't find any. They're repeating the patterns, but uh, not that many. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had a question about uh, feature engineering. Yeah. And what do you think of uh, deep learning? Uh, you know, the promise of deep learning is that it can do the feature engineering for you using some unsupervised learning uh, first and then do some supervised, supervised learning later. That's not how I see deep learning. That's not how I see deep learning. That's right. In my opinion, deep learning. Learning is just a, a fancy name, name for uh, deep neural networks. Uh, and uh, the deep neural networks, uh, the word feature means different things in the deep neural network compared to when we talk about this kind 
Okay. So the Velo features are, how do I say, like, all shapes and edges and stuff. So they're all the same. But in, in this kind of feature engineering, actually, every feature engineering is actually different. Let's say, if the last transaction was the same as the previous transaction, like there's, there's no really another thing like a shape or edges. So you don't see the same technique applicable to the, these kinds of data sets? No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that way. Visual recognition and audio and... No. You see them as yeah, I think in a way that the okay, I'm really bad with real analysis, but but in a way that the function functional space in this kind of feature engineering is much larger than than the like visual or, or sound visual and the song the uh, like feature space actually it's all also it's very small because they are they are they are spatial and temporal and there are only so many things, but there's infinite amount of ways. Who collapse the transactions in one way? There's so many different ways. No, it's a central kind of automation and model selection. So if you have like these stack models, so is there any kind of automation? Or it seems like it could be. Yeah, probably sure about that. Yeah, you can. 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 Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> this is for a Vasu competition, which you're currently leading, and I know it's still going on, so I'm sure you can't say much. But are you using that fast solution that was posted in the forums at all? No, not. Are you using like follow the regularized leader, at, which is the core of that? No, no. GPM is tough. GPM is tough. But uh, you know that I can tell you something which is this. This competition is very similar to the to the Critio competition. Right. Just you, you have to at least read the critical winners uh, publications, right? So but that was all like, like online learning linear models. Right? Actually, it's not. No, go read the three years. I read it, but I forgot. <laughs> 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 you mentioned in your talk the necessity of linear models, yeah. and uh, yeah. I didn't see the data. Yeah. Yeah. That seems yeah. to imply yeah. that you're kind of opposed to. Uh, producing the data to be able to do nonlinear fitting. Is that the case? Like if there's computational issues with doing a nonlinear predictive fit? Oh. Like would you prefer to keep the high density and do a linear fit as opposed like to reducing the amount of data? Just so kind of pick up fit. as much there as there are actually data. ways, so there this are ways cool. like uh, Have you ever done this? Uh, uh, but I usually take, take take the, so so that's that's actually most the vision stuff. So the linear solution in radio. Basically, you take a sample of your. Stuff. It's possible to take a sample of data so and extract the linearity and, and then put that Thank back you. into a large <laughs> linear model. Thanks again for oh, so you use that as the yeah. underlying yeah. predictive curve yeah. that you yeah. can yeah. do a linear. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Yes. Fan club for all the fancy stuff. Like KDP people came to take a picture with them. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Yeah. Sir, so what kind of hardware setup do you use for this? Actually, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a quite a good computer. Actually. I have a, I have a.